So now we saw the idea of a hierarchical namespace and now we have to manage this. Who's doing what um, inside, well, this tree. At the top level with ICANN, IANA, they manage the root. I will come back to the root and what you have to do there. On the second level, we have many, many, many organizations because it's a different organization handling the country code for Sweden compared to the one for Germany, for example. And as you saw, we have also that museum. That's a different organization, sometimes companies, sometimes different types of organizations. So in Germany, it's DENIC. They organized this and they make sure that on the next level, the second level, we again have these unique names. But once they said, okay, you can use this and that unique name, it's out of their control what then the next organization does within the, this next level. So our university can deal with all these, let's say, uh, third level, and then we have a fourth level, etc. So this then depends on the next organization. And this makes this, well, manageable, this complexity. Because you can imagine how huge this tree is. So we subdivide this based on the hierarchy and say, okay, there is no single organization really uh, taking care of all the single issues there. So inside this subdomain, this part of the tree, only our university takes care, etc. So that's the idea. So in the end, I can delegates responsibility of the country .de to DENIC. And DENIC delegates then FU Berlin DE to Freie Universität. And Freie Universität then can delegate the management of all these names inside one of these third levels to the computer science and math department. And this ensures basically that there's only one institution called FU Berlin in the DE namespace. There could be, I'm not aware of, but there could be another one saying, okay, I'm fuberlin.tse. This is feasible looking from a DNS perspective. It's still unique because SE Sweden is not the same as Germany. But then we will run into legal issues because, well, final state Berlin, trademark, etc., etc. So we wouldn't like this. And the final state take, uh, takes care that there's only one department called math informatics. So the math CS department. So that's the idea. And in the end, then we have companies or organizations handling the different, well, levels. So there's the DENIC for Germany. And if you want to register something with the DE, the end, top level domain, you have to go to DENIC. Well, you don't have to directly go to DENIC. You go typically to a company offering DE domains. And then this company checks if it's still available, sells you the domain or the right to use the domain and does all this registration. So that's the basic idea. You don't have to talk directly to DENIC. In former times, it was this case, but today you have all the companies selling this. And then you have quite cheap domains and some others are quite expensive. Okay, so not that complicated. Now let's have a closer look into how this is organized. Because one thing is that you set up this structure, this tree, and now we know how this, tr this tree is built and we know who is responsible for which part. But now we have to implement this somehow. Okay, so two aspects, two concepts. One is this administrative concept. There we saw a domain is managed by a single organization. So for .de, it was DENIC. 
fine. And then we know they make sure that there's no one else, etc., etc., no duplicated names, and so on. And we also saw we can delegate responsibility for subdomains. So, for example, fu minus Berlin was given to Freie Universität in Berlin. Okay. What else do we need? Well, DENIC in our case, they at least need some pointers to all their subdomains. Because if someone asks DENIC, I have no idea what is this FU minus Berlin DE. I only see DE. And I know you, Denik, you're responsible for DE, but I have no idea whom to ask for a certain computer at FU Berlin. Then at least Denik doesn't have to know all the computers. No, no, no. But Denik has to know there is a certain pointer. So if someone asks Denik who is responsible for this and that computer, then Denik at least knows, okay, second level FU Berlin. Then I will forward, and I will show you the examples for this, this request to FU Berlin. So you have to maintain the pointers to then the roots of the next subdomains to be able to forward the requests. And we'll see how it works if someone even doesn't know that DENIC is responsible for DE, the country code. Okay, very rare case, but I will show you the idea. So we have this administrative concept, delegation following the hierarchies. Then we need also, this has to be reflected also in a technical concept. What does it mean? Well, we have to maintain a database. Now I already said that, okay, to have one huge database for everything on this planet doesn't work. What do we need at least? So we need at least, now let's stay with this example. There must be at the level of DE, so that's responsibility of DNIC, Network Information Center, Germany. We have to have at least, let's say, a smaller database with exactly these pointers to the subdomain. So there must be entries at least they have to know whom to ask. They don't have to know all the computers, but they have to know all the subdomains. So that's the, the idea. So inside these databases, we always store a part of our tree. So a part of the namespace. And this part of the tree is called a zone stored in a zone file. And the name save server now, DENIC, has the authority over this zone. So DENIC is responsible for the server storing the zone with all the information about the next level, the next subdomains. So that's the idea. So you can manage multiple zones, etc. You have to store the information, so and there are no standard guidelines, etc. But the key idea here is that at least at a certain level, you have to know what are the next subdomains. Maybe you know even more. But this is something that's basically an add-on. You can learn, you can cache, etc. But at least you have to know this part. So technically speaking, we need this database. And then, typically, it's too dangerous to have only one database. We have several of them. So what do we have? We have the primary master. That's a must-have. That's mandatory. And this primary master has this database, resource records of the subdomains, and whatever is in the zone of the master. And then there may be some secondary masters. That's optional. 
typically you have this because it's a replication and this is good for uh, reliability, etc. of the whole system. Both primary and second master, they are called authoritative for the zone. So if you ask them, they should give you the correct answer. Why primary or secondary? That's just for tolerance, etc. So they are authoritative. So if you ask the primary master of .de for something, then the answer should be correct. It's called authoritative because this master is responsible for this zone. We will see that in most cases you will get so-called non-authoritative answers if you perform a DNS request. Why? Because, as you will learn, we typically use caches in immediate systems that cached some answers, partial answers. They will answer, because that's much faster than accessing these more centralized databases, but then these answers are called non-authoritative. Because the one giving you the answer is not officially responsible for the zone. Only the primary master and the secondary master. So, that's the core idea. So, what do you have to know? Let's go to this very simple example that for DE, this primary master, responsible is DENIC, they have to know at least whatever Amazon.te, FUBerlin.te, and those tens of thousands others using DE. They do not have to know whatever computer is down he here, the computer Mars at the math informatics department or whatever. Nope, they don't have to know this. Nah, it's um, not a problem if they know, but they don't have to know. Okay, this answers the question of how you organize the domains and the subdomains. Because also here we have a primary master here at the level of the university knowing everything about math informatics, about biology, chemistry, pharmacy, about physics, about and so on. So all the subdomains there, etc. So hierarchical system, you know, 127 levels, etc. This doesn't answer the question, um, what if someone says, okay, there's a computer, uh, our oslo.mathinformatics.fu uh, minus Berlin, oops, dot de. So uh, I want to contact this one, um, whom to ask. I do not even know this. Okay, very rare case, but okay, if you don't know Germany and .de or whatever, this could happen. What does it mean? You don't know whom to ask. You don't know uh, that, okay, I can't contact these guys. You, you don't know this. This is why in our tree we have a root. So, if you're completely lost in the namespace, then at least you can ask the root. Perfect. And, as we learned, at least the root knows all top-level domains. That's cool. So, there's a database. The database is not that big because, it, okay, several, maybe thousand, whatever, top-level domains, not that many, but at least you have to know them. But now imagine everyone asks this root. Could happen because, well, you don't have uh, any cache entries or whatever. Or what happens if this database crashes? So from the very beginning, we had several root servers. 13 in the beginning, 13 professionally managed root servers. So you may think, okay, 13, well, okay, that's quite a redundancy. Okay, come back in a second. This is how such a root server 
looks like. Okay, well, it's a computer, <laughs> not that interesting, and some blinking lights, and um, so that's how a root server looks like. Okay, so we're 13 of them, but that was the situation in the very early days. So you see that and the root servers, they have letters from A to M, so 13 of them, and still today we have letters A to M. But you see this concentration here, historical reasons. There was one, Nordenet in Stockholm, uh, one in London. Uh, so is this really distributed? How many are in Africa, Australia, whatever? So the problem here is, what happens if something happens to those computers? You may think, it. okay, come on, we have 13 of them. So what can happen? So we had an interesting incident in the 90s. DNS was down because the root servers had a bug in their operating system. Because 11 out of the 13 were running the identical BSD operating system. Uh, so although we have 13 instances, if you run the same operating system, you suffer from the same bug. So monoculture is really a bad idea. So we have to replicate more and we have to avoid monoculture. There's another problem that uh, DNS, I mentioned this in the beginning, uh, was the step out of pure technology into raw politics, etc. And if you control the phone book, you control the internet. And that's one of the problems. So in the end, it's not a good idea that this most of the servers are located in the US. So we need more distribution. This happened over time. And today we have a situation where we have 1,756 instances operated by independent root server operators all over the world. This also helps for, you know, answering the requests much, much faster. Okay, so that's the uh, current situation. And you see that even we in Berlin have several replicas of different root servers like I and K and D and F and E, etc. So coming to some questions. Now, scaling, how does delegation help? How do we delegate? Why does it scale? What do we need at least to know to answer certain requests? So uh, what does the domain have to store? Who stores this information? about the namespace, whole namespace, parts of it, etc. Does anyone store the whole namespace of the internet? Hmm. Is this necessary? And in this context, what is a zone? What does it mean? And then if you ask, if you send a request, an ask request, sometimes you get back authoritative, but most of the times non-authoritative answers. What does it mean? Are they wrong because they are non-authoritative? Why do we have several masters in a zone? And how did we really make DNS more robust compared to the early days?